So welcome back drifters. Today we're back in the garage and what we're doing today is we're going to work on finishing up this LS engine. We're going to try to get this thing completely built today because I finally have all the parts. I actually got all the new main bearings we needed for the crankshaft. I went and installed them the other night and I checked to make sure that everything fit. Everything was looking really good as well as the rod bearings. I got a whole new set. These are very much so overkill for this engine because this is just a basic engine rebuild. But it's what we needed to get the clearances that we wanted, so everything's looking really good. I've got all the parts I need to put this thing together, and that's what we're going to do. But first things first, we need to take our lifters and soak them. So when it comes to soaking the lifters, it's a very simple trick. All you got to do is put it in a Ziploc bag, fill it up with a bunch of 30 weight oil, and let it sit. So that's why we're doing this before we start building everything else, so hopefully it'll have enough time to soak up a lot of oil. That way we're not dealing with bum lifters on the first start. Okay, so if you were to look at this piston, would you assume that this thing's good to go? It's definitely not. Now, part of the reason why is because inside all of those rings there is a whole bunch of carbon buildup and crap that we need to get out of there. So what I'm going to do is clean out all of these pistons by taking out all the rings and getting in there with a pick. So what I did is I took a pick and I straightened it out so that way I can get inside there and actually clean this thing up. So you can tell that inside the grooves are super clean compared to what they used to look like. I mean, they were really, really bad. So now it's nice and clean. We got a nice ring groove where we're not gonna worry about the rings binding up and causing us any kind of problems in the future. So I guess it's finally time to get the crankshaft put in. So let's get to it. Okay, so now I got this thing nice and cleaned up. We're gonna put in some assembly lube, get that thing nice and good in there. There she goes. All right, so all we're gonna do now is we're gonna take our crankshaft and we're going to place it inside the engine, but we're going to need to be very careful when we do this. So I'm going to line this thing up as best as I can and set it down in there. Here we go. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little bit of lube on each one of these bearings, and then we're going to get the main caps and plug those things in there. So here's a tightening sequence for the crankshaft. All you got to do is tighten down the inner and outer bolts to 15 foot-pounds. And then once you get that, then you're going to do your torque angle. For the inner bolts, you're going to do 80 degrees. And then for the outer bolts, you're going to do 51 degrees. Now the issue is when it comes to doing the side bolts. So I'm reusing my main bolts. And because of that, the side bolts on these things from the factory had a little bit of sealant. So I'm going to use a little bit of RTV on the side of them just to make sure that we don't have any oil leaks coming out the side of this block. And we're just going to end up torquing it down a spec. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to move the crank one direction. We're going to zero out the gauge as best we can, okay? And then we're going to flip it around, and we're going to see just how much end play we have. In my case, it looks like just about three thousandths. So now we're going to put in the crank angle sensor. Just make sure you lube up the O-ring, and then you basically just slide it right in there and tighten down that bolt. So I finished putting in the crank, and I ran into a few little issues I'm going to have to correct, but... Let me tell you, Texas has the most bipolar weather patterns you're ever going to see because yesterday I was wearing literally shorts and a short sleeve shirt and overnight it froze. I mean, it's frozen. I mean, that's actual ice. Okay. <laughs> Luckily, I got this little room heater and uh, it should keep me a little bit warm. We'll see how it does. But last night I actually ran into a little bit of issue with the crank where I was getting this weird tight spot when I would rotate it and I couldn't figure out exactly what was going on. But uh, it turned out that one of the main caps was just a little bit crooked. So I went back reinstalled everything all over again and now I've got a good drag on it so when I'm rotating it it's nice and smooth let me show you with a beam torque wrench so for those of you that may not know this is a beam torque wrench and these are very old school but essentially what it does is it's going to read on there and it'll tell us exactly what our torque is to break this thing away I mean watch this thing doesn't even register on the beam like as I go up it like doesn't even move so we are very good there so that thing is smooth as butter so we're good to go as far as the crankshaft goes now we're gonna move on to doing connecting rods and pistons so this is where we get to mess around with piston rings and boy oh boy is that ever fun yep now I'm definitely gonna close the garage because boy oh boy is that cold Okay, so when it comes to piston ring clearance, it's very simple. For us, we're doing a stock rebuild, so obviously if you're doing performance or turbo or something like that, you'd have to open it up a lot more. But all we're worried about right now is the minimum clearances for what we're doing. So for a stock rebuild on our engine, we're gonna take our bore, which is 3.78, multiplied by the multiplier, which is 4 thousandths of an inch. So that gives us a minimum clearance in our top ring of about 15 thousandths of an inch. Probably gonna aim a little bit wider than that, but for our second ring, it's pretty much the same thing. We're gonna do our bore, 3.78, and then we're gonna multiply it by 5 thousandths of an inch, which should give us about 19 thousandths of an inch of clearance. So now we're gonna have a good ballpark that we can aim for for just a stock rebuild. Obviously, if we were going turbo or something like that, it would be way more open. 
Now, I just checked what the OEM ones were, and literally the ones that we pulled out of this engine were reading about 25 thousandths in the top ring. So there's a good wide range where we can go where we're gonna be safe. So even if we overshoot it a little bit, we should be okay. So the key is that we are at least within that minimum distance. So when we're checking these piston rings, what we're doing is we're gently sliding it inside the bore and lining it up, but just putting it in is not gonna make it perfectly level. Usually you have to use something like this. Now this is from when we did the LS3 on uh, Chris's Corvette engine, but this will not fit our bores because it's too big because that was a 6.2 liter, this is a 4.8. So there's a trick we can do to kind of get around using one of these tools. Let me show you how we do it. So now I'm pretty sure that I've mentioned how to do this before, but essentially what we're doing is we're gonna put a ring in this very bottom groove here, and then that's gonna create a stopper for us so we know that we're about one inch down when we put this thing in. But it's also gonna make sure that it's going in nice and straight and it's nice and level because if this thing's crooked, that could change our gaps. So if you notice by putting it in the very bottom groove, it's actually the same distance as the real tool that you would end up spending all that money on. So uh, it works really well. Okay, so we got it in there. Now we're just gonna use this to set it down and we're gonna level it off. There we go. Nice and level. And now we can check our gap. So for the top ring, we know we need 15 thousandths minimum. So that's what we're gonna go first. Okay, that fits in there nicely. So we know we're at least good on the minimum, but let's find out what we really have. All right, so we got about 20 thousandths for the top ring. Now we'll do the same thing for the second ring. So for the second ring, we know for a minimum we want 19 thousandths. So let's see what we get. Just barely got 19 on there. So what I need to do now is check all the other boards, check all the other rings, and make sure they're all good to go before we install them. Because, you know, if these two little ring lamps decide they want to touch and make up, uh, we could have a bad day and have to do this all over again. So organization is key when it comes to doing your piston ring gaps. You have to make sure these things are organized because each individual bore can be slightly different. So if you start mixing up rings, you might have a different clearance than what you're actually aiming for. Okay, I know this looks like a wild mess, but essentially what I did is I took this, I lined it up based off of the piston and the bore that it's going in. I put top ring up top, second ring on the bottom, and then I checked all the clearances on the oil rings. So they're all looking pretty good. I had to swap two rings out on each side just to get them somewhat even. So now they're all generally about the same number, but these numbers are a little bit off. Okay, so the top rings are clearancing out around what would be considered a modified or a performance build. So if we were gonna go that same gap on the bottom rings, they'd be too tight. So we're gonna have to file them. So luckily I've got this really nice ring grinder here that I'm gonna use to do this. Now, I have done it by hand using a file. It is very possible to do, but my God, does it take forever, okay? It's about 50 million years later, and uh, I'm still on the very first ring, but I think I just about got it. I mean, you're literally going one at a time, like just one at a time, and it takes all day, all day to do like three rings. So this is a godsend, and it is very expensive for a tool that I'm only gonna use every once in a blue moon, but boy, let me tell you, when I do use it, it is so nice. So now one key point I want to make about this ring grinder is that you have to make sure that these things are going on straight because if they don't go on perfectly straight, you can end up with a weird angle. So when the rings actually come together, you can actually have a weird gap that you don't want. So it's very important that when you're grinding the rings that they are completely flat and that the blade is spinning toward the inner direction of the ring because if it's going the opposite direction, you're going to get burrs going out towards your piston walls, which you don't want. Obviously, when we're done grinding these rings, we're still gonna have to deburr them either way, but it's imperative that you grind towards the inside of the ring. So I'm gonna get to grinding these rings down. We're gonna aim for about 20 to 21 thousandths worth of clearance. And if I hit those numbers, we're doing pretty good. So let's hit it. So for the first time ever, I was able to grind every single ring and get everything within about five tenths of each other. It's, it's amazing. It, this was probably one of the best ring grinding experiences I've ever had. Okay, for some reason my camera thinks the helmet is a face. It keeps focusing on that. Focus on my face. It's my face. Okay, <laughs> anyway. So here's the thing about piston ring orientation. If you don't get it right, it doesn't matter what your ring gaps are because you're gonna have blow by. So let's get these things put on correctly. Okay, so almost every single piston you're gonna have is gonna have some sort of mark to show you where the front is. In my case, it's a dot. Sometimes it's even an arrow pointing in the direction or it'll even be the word that just says front. So that's important to know just so that way we get it lined up properly. My top ring is gonna be facing 
up here towards the top with the bottom ring facing out towards the bottom. We're gonna put our oil expander ring with the section up here. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the top oil ring gap, which would be over here on this side and then the bottom ring, which would be on this side. And then that way we have it all clocked properly. So now I'm gonna go ahead and put that on there. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take our oil expander and we're gonna place that onto the piston. Basically, we're just wrapping it all the way around just to get it inside there. And then we'll orient it to where we want it. Now it's very important that the ends of this thing just butt together and that they don't overlap. Because if they overlap, you're gonna have a problem. Okay, so we're gonna take our oil expander rings and we're just gonna wrap it around over the top of the oil expander. Very careful not to scratch the sides of the piston and just work it into position. Then what we're going to do is we're going to put the top one in its position. I'm going to hold it down with my thumb just to kind of hold it in place and then wrap it around the piston just kind of slowly working it on there until we get it in place. Now when I get to the very end, I, again, I'm just going to very gently pry up on it so it doesn't scratch the piston and then we should have it in place. So sometimes these oil expander rings can get kind of moved around, so it's nice to have a pick that you can use to kind of put it in position where you want, just to make sure that you've got it lined up exactly where it needs to be. It's good to make sure that the oil rings are sitting on top of the expander and not behind it, because that could be an issue. Now luckily my second ring has a marking on it that tells me which side is up and which side's down. In my case it says top, sometimes it's a dot, sometimes it's just some random marking just to let you know. So it's just important to make sure it's in the right position. So what we're doing now is using the ring expander tool to get the ring on there. Now we want to open it up just enough to get it over the edge of the piston and get it in the groove without over expanding the ring. Because if we over expand the ring, we can mess with the tension that the ring naturally has. So now that we got it in there, we should be good. So now the second ring is in a good position. So now we'll move on to doing the top one. So unfortunately, my top rings don't have any identifiers on them at all. There's nothing telling me which side goes up, left, right, whatever. It just doesn't exist. But that's because these things are square. There's no bevel in it. If there was a bevel, usually they'll have a mark um, or it'll say somewhere in the instructions as to which direction it goes up or down. So that's kind of important. But usually one of the best ways you can tell if it's a top ring is on the side, it's got this little like chromoly face on it. So it's usually real shiny. That's usually a good indicator of whether or not it's a top or a second ring. But anyway, let's get these things expanded and get them on. The top ring goes on just like the bottom ring. We're gonna carefully expand it just enough to slide it over, but not too much. I just don't wanna overextend. There we go, okay. And there we go. All right, we got top ring on there now, so we should be good to go as far as these go. So now what we need to do is get the ring compressor and then put it into the engine. So let's do it. Okay, so I'm taking the rod caps off so that way we can actually slide this thing over the crank because if that thing's on there, how else is it gonna go on? Boom. Okay, so what I have here is a very old school ring compressor. Now, this thing works, but it is not the most ideal way to do it. They have kits that you can literally line up for your exact bore, and you can pretty much push it in by hand. It works very well, they're tapered. Problem is I don't have one, so we're gonna use the old school method of doing it, and hopefully we'll do okay. The problem is with these, sometimes the rings have a tendency to wanna push out the bottom, because in order for these to work, you gotta hit it with a hammer. I use a dead blow hammer, but you could do a rubber mallet or something like that. Uh, but yeah, so what we're gonna do first is we're gonna set the crank to the very bottom position, and then we're gonna line this up as best we can, make sure our dots are facing in the correct position. So in order to avoid any major issues, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lube up the tool with some 30 weight oil. I made sure the bores are nice and lubed up with some 30 weight oil, and I'm gonna lube up the rings just to be extra safe here. It also helps just to helping it glide through here a lot easier. <laughs> this thing could be a pain, but let's go ahead and see what happens. Let's work on number two and see how we do. God, what is it with me and puns? So right now what I'm doing is I'm just rechecking to make sure I've got these things lined up properly. And then we're just gonna slide this over the top of the rings, just enough to hold it there. And then we're gonna clamp it down. So when it comes to tightening this thing, it can be kind of a pain. Sometimes you have to pull this lever and turn and it's a little bit of a pain to get, but eventually it comes out. So now we need to lube up our bearings. All I'm gonna do is just apply a small dab of assembly lube Okay, so now we got our assembly lube on there. We're just gonna spread that a little bit. So I got a life hack for all you V8 guys out there. I've seen a lot of guys work on these things, but they seem to forget that it's on an engine stand and you can literally have it straight up and down so that way you can actually see what you're doing and not having to hunch over. So yeah, a little quality of life tip for you. I mean, look at this. Now I can see straight down and I can see exactly what I'm looking for. So let's try to get the piston in. 
Just making sure I got my alignment correct. We're gonna gently place this in place. Put the skirt slightly in there just to make sure we're good. Nice and level. Let's see if we can get this in one go. Nope. Yep, we popped out, you can see. Boy, oh boy. All right, let's try this again. Now we'll just send this thing to Jesus. Hey, we got her. All right, we're in. Okay, so now let's go guide it onto the crankshaft. So you might be wondering, Kyle, why don't you just flip the engine over and make it easy on yourself? Well, because I don't want to risk that dang piston going flying out like we've had happen in the past. So we're gonna do it this way. So all I'm doing here is I'm guiding this thing down by hand and making sure that I don't hit the crankshaft. We're just guiding it over it. There we go. I'm gonna add a little extra lube there for a sec. Okay, so I'm gonna put a little bit of lube on the end cap. Now we're gonna slide this thing up here. Now I'm only putting in these rod bolts hand tight. I'm not actually cranking them on yet because I don't want to torque these on until I have this here to support it to prevent it from twisting. We don't want these things twisting on us. So let me hurry up and get this stuff done so that way we can move on to the next step. So for stock connecting rod bolts, when you torque them down, you gotta do 15 pounds on the first pass. And then when you go to do the final pass, you have to do a torque angle of 60 degrees, which, oh boy, is that ever fun to do. So we actually ended up upgrading our bolts to ARPs because, well, on the ARPs, you actually use what's called the rod stretch method. So when we're doing this, we're measuring the actual stretch of the bolt and making sure that when we torque this thing down that we're getting the exact amount of stretch that we need for each individual bolt. So the torque is actually gonna vary from bolt to bolt. Luckily, we've already got all that figured out, and now it's just a matter of rinse and repeating the entire process until we're done. So one thing, we just want to make sure we got enough side clearance here between the connecting rods, but uh, we're looking pretty good at about 13 thousandths. Can we take a second just to appreciate how amazing it is that these engines happen to stay running day in and day out, considering that all it takes is one little thing to go wrong, and they just completely fall apart, but they don't. That's pretty incredible. I mean, literally, all it takes is one of these bolts to give out, and the whole thing just falls apart. Like, one bolt. That's all it takes. But are you ready for the most fun part of this entire build? It's called putting in the camshaft and setting timing. Oh, yeah, it's a lot of fun, let me tell you. Okay, so I don't know if you could see that, but on my dad's original camshaft, you can see that there's this blue marks here that are showing up on the sides here. That's from it getting way too hot. It should never get that hot. Um, there's even these weird marks on the actual cam, so we ended up getting a different one right up here. So this is a completely brand new cam, but it's a OEM cam. So nothing special, but you know what? It's going to get the job done, so we're not going to complain about that. So this one basically becomes a boat anchor, and that one goes into the engine. So let's do it. But anyway, let's do the camshaft. So first things first, got to put a whole bunch of lube on this sucker because, uh, you know, I haven't had to try this like three times already, and I'm not just re-lubing this thing up for the third time for no apparent reason. But uh, <laughs> what we're going to do is take our shaft and shove it in the hole. And as you know, whenever you're shoving shafts inside holes, you can never have enough lube. It's a very important thing to have, especially when you're building engines, because, you know, lubrication is the key to preventing your shaft from getting stuck in the hole. You don't want a stuck shaft inside of a hole. That's a very bad day for everyone, so... You know, as long as you got enough lube, you should be okay. But you can see, sometimes it doesn't seem to get stuck, but it's just a matter of manipulating the shaft as you're putting it into the hole. And if you gently manipulate it properly, it should slide right in. In my case, we're getting stuck, and that's not good. So we'll see if we can get this sucker. Come on, baby, there we go, one more. And get in there, yeah, we did it. Well, almost. Hang on, hang on, ah, there we go, okay, we got her. Okay, I need to go get this garage open because I am so tired of working in the dark, so I'm gonna get that going. Oh my God, it's sunlight. Oh God, I feel like a vampire. I've been trapped inside here too long. Okay, so here's a quick tip. When it comes to removing this lower timing gear, it can be a pain, and a lot of times it's because there's this really long hole inside the crank and you have a hard time getting a bolt in there. So what I did is I took the harmonic balancer tool and I popped off this tip because this is what you use to pop it off, and then that sits in there perfectly, and then you can easily get a plier, like one of these jaw pliers. This is a two jaw, but you could use a three or whatever. Now that I got this thing on here, it's got a stopper there so it can stop it from going through and still pull out. Now, one more thing I like to do is just add a little bit of heat to this because sometimes I can help separate it. I'm not gonna try to bake this thing. I just wanna warm it up a little bit. Oh, we're turning the crank, eh? I think, oh, there it goes. 
Oh boy, that's gonna be fun to get off. Well, I would not suggest doing this, but uh, <laughs> you know. It does appear to be moving a little bit, but man, that thing is stuck on there. Looks like my tip is turning into a pain in the ass. It's working, but man, stuff is never easy. And oh my God, if you know what it's like living with a Husky, I swear their hair gets everywhere. No matter what I do, I try to be clean and it just gets everywhere. Ugh, Huskies. I've been working on, a oh shit. <laughs> Got a time of gear. All right, that thing is, yeah, there she goes. All right, come on, baby. Wow, <laughs> these things are never easy, but at least this gives you a way to do it. Could you imagine trying to do that, like just prying? You'd probably damage your crank and who knows what else, but uh, yeah, so that's how I get these things off. Pain in the butt, but they will eventually come off. So now what I need to do is get the new one on. And that's just as fun. So in this segment of Cooking with Kyle, I'd like to show you all the benefits for living a lonely life of despair. Example number one. You can cook your timing here in your oven. Oh God, don't let your wife see this one. Oh God, it's hot. Ooh, that's a hot tamale. Ooh, that's a hot tamale. Oh damn, it's nighttime. Okay, we're good. We still got steam going on this thing. Let's get this sucker on there. Oh, it's burnt my hand. Oh, it's so hot. Now, if we're lucky enough and it's hot enough, we should be able to slide this sucker right on. And we are almost on there. There we go. Bam. And that was cooking with Kyle. <laughs> oh, God. My house smells like burnt oil. <laughs> I'm glad that worked. So the recipe for this dish is one timing gear at 350 degrees for a little... Ooh. Shit. I don't know if you guys heard that, but that was gunshots. That was, that was a full magazine right there. Holy shit. Well, I'm gonna go get mine. It's because of the way YouTube is, I probably shouldn't tell you what I have, but you might be able to see a little something over there. But basically, I'm well protected. You know, we do live in Texas, and in Texas, everyone's got a gun. But, um, yeah, hopefully, whatever that was, it was nothing crazy, but that was a full magazine. So, somebody just dumped an entire magazine out there. <sighs> boy, oh boy, oh boy. Well, on that note, I am going to shut the garage because uh, I don't want to deal with all that. So hopefully everyone's okay out there. I don't know. I haven't heard anything. I didn't see any sirens, but whatever. Anyway, the recipe for this thing was one timing gear at 350 degrees for about an hour, and that thing slid right on. So, you know, it's pretty simple to do, and it's way easier than trying to press it on. So, yeah. Next, we're going to go ahead and put the camera plane... Blah, 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 blah cam retaining plate in there as well as the cam timing gear so let's do it so this cam plate is super cheap i think i paid like 10 bucks but it also gives you new hardware with the sealant on it so yeah it's worth the upgrade it's better to just replace it than to have a leaky one and i guess even if it did leak a little bit like whatever but you know what we're going this far we may as well do this right too you know oh, what the hell <laughs> My little adapter thing just snapped on me. This little, like, <laughs> good lord. Oh, man, this is what I get for not having the right tools. Ugh. Okay, it's my last adapter, so hopefully this one will hold up. Come on, you can do it. I think it's going to snap. There it is. Oh. There we go. Cool. So one nice thing about the GM LS engines is how easy it is to set up the timing and everything. I mean, even just getting the timing gear on, like there's a little keyway, so you can't really mess it up and there's not really a way to advance the timing like you would on a uh, old school block. Like a lot of these OEM ones, they only go on one way. So I'm an idiot and forgot to put on the timing chain. <laughs> a lot of good these gears will do without a timing chain, so uh, I'm gonna have to redo that. <sighs> I hate myself sometimes. Well, my kid and I hate myself all the time. So uh, I should also mention that there's a process called degrading a camshaft. If this was a aftermarket camshaft, we'd definitely be doing that, but this thing is completely OEM. So it's super simple for us. We already know it's all gonna work. So we're just gonna roll with it the way it is. But if you're actually doing something like this and you're doing an aftermarket cam, definitely degree your camshaft. It's definitely important. All right, so I'm just gonna hang this chain on here. I got it a little bit lubed up just to you know, help it out on the first start, basically. Now this is where it's kind of important because if we don't get this on the exact correct tooth, we'll be out of line. You see how that's that's off by a tooth. 
So if we do it like that, we should be dead on and this thing should line right up, boom. Got a decent amount of deflection there, so we're looking pretty good. I tell you, if there's a hard way to do something, I'll figure it out. There we go. You can see up there that we're top dead center, and down here we are definitely dot to dot. God, I really need to sleep more. I haven't been sleeping well over the last two days, but it's neither here nor there. What we need to do is work on getting this oil pump on. I'm just trying to get the energy back that I had a few days ago. It's just taking me a while to get it back. But anyway, let's get back to doing the oil pump. This thing is uh, pretty simple. Some people will take this front cover off, they'll put little shims in it, make it work, do all that fun stuff, but we're just gonna make this thing fit. We're not really too concerned with it. This thing's OEM, and it's not that difficult to do. It's just a matter of lining up the splines inside there, and then once it's lined up, boom, you're in there. See, it's really not that bad. Now, obviously, we're gonna turn this thing around, make sure that it still spins freely, but it's very simple. So the only other thing I do is I put a little bit of Loctite on these bolts, just the blue stuff, just to be safe. I don't think it's required, but I like putting it on stuff like this because, you know, if our oil pump breaks free, that's uh, that's definitely gonna be a big issue. So we don't want that. So they do sell a tool for getting this thing aligned properly. Um, and this basically just goes on here and helps keep this thing centered. But I mean, you can just do it by hand. You just have to be very careful and also make sure it doesn't bind. But yeah, just FYI. So now that I got this thing on here, I'm just gonna torque these things down to about 18 foot-pounds. All right, so now what we'll do, take this out. Boom, there we go. So I'm just putting the crank bolt in here so that way we can turn this thing over and make sure it's not binding. All right, looks like it's turning good. So one thing I forgot is that oil will eat through plastic. And uh, yeah, this bag's a little leaky, so let's get the lifters in. So it's very important when you're installing your lifters that you pay attention to the orientation of the oil hole. Most lifters will have them facing straight up, some will have them facing to the sides, but almost none of them will be facing straight down because you want that oil to cover the lifter as it's running through it. Oh, and I also tightened down the retaining bolts to 106 inch pounds. Okay, so it's that time. Let's whip out the Play-Doh and check our valve clearance. So this is why checking piston to valve clearance is so important because even though this is a stock engine rebuild, I still managed to find something critical here because if I hadn't done this, we definitely would have blown the motor. Let me show you why. Now I know what you're thinking, but no, this is a perfect mold of the combustion chamber. Problem is I see a spot here where it looks like it went through. So now obviously we don't have a head gasket on this thing, so that could be part of the issue. But if you add the things to the head gasket, that's not nearly enough clearance. So I'm definitely gonna have to retest this. So I'm gonna go ahead and redo this test because something doesn't seem quite right there. I wanna make sure that we have the right clearances. So I'm gonna do that real quick and then we'll see what we end up with. So as it turns out, it's a very good thing we checked this piston to valve clearance because it was way too tight. We actually made contact in one of the pistons. So that's where we're gonna have to check our push rod lengths because this is an OEM push rod. It's 7.4 inches and it's too long. So what we have to do to set the push rod length is pretty simple. What we gotta do is get the cylinder head on there with the head gasket on. We're using a, a one that's already been used before, not a brand new one, because we don't wanna crush it. I'm only using a couple bolts to hold it in place just so that way it actually stays where it needs to be, but we're not torquing it, okay? So what I'm doing now is I'm taking my push rod length checker and I'm putting it about 7.35 and we're gonna test and see if that's the correct size. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna first do the intake side. So in order to do that, we need a push rod on the exhaust side. We're gonna crank the engine over and we're gonna feel for the moment that the exhaust starts to push up. Second it pushes up, we know that the intake is on the base circle. So now we can do the intake side. So we're looking at the camshaft. This is the top where the lobe's gonna be at the highest point. The base circle is on the bottom portion of that. That's what you're trying to find. So now we need to figure out what zero lash is for the intake side. Very simple, all we do is we put the rocker arm on and we tighten it down just to the point where there's no up and down movement. It could have a little bit of side to side, but no up and down. Once we get that, we know we have zero lash. Then all we have to do is take our torque wrench and count the number of rotations it takes to meet our torque number. Now for a Gen 3, it's 22 foot-pounds. For a Gen 4, it's 25 foot-pounds. So in my case, I got a Gen 3 and I'm trying to get within three quarters of a turn to one and a quarter turn. If we're in there, in that range, we're good. So what I did is I took it and I counted from the very top and I turned it over and for the intake side, we got just over three quarters. So it's actually right where we want it in terms of preload. So the exhaust side is reverse of the intake side. All we're doing is we're feeling the intake push rod this time. For the second it starts to lift, then we know the exhaust is on the base circle. So then what we do is we set zero lash for the exhaust rocker arm. 
we get our torque setting set and we count the number of turns. For me, it was right at around one turn. It was plus or minus a little bit, but we're within what would be considered good. So technically I could have used a slightly shorter push rod on the exhaust side, but I think a 3.5 or a 7.35 is gonna be good enough especially considering this thing is just an OEM rebuild. So here's an example as to why the stock push rod was too long. Because when I put the stock push rod in and we set it to zero lash and then go to torque it down, it took almost two full turns before we actually got it to torque. So we know for a fact that that push rod's too long because if the push rod is longer, it's gonna take more turns. If the push rod is shorter, it's gonna take less turns. The key is that when we do this, we get between three quarter and one and a quarter turns. Okay, so now that we know our push rod length is a 7.35, I ended up ordering a set from Brian Tooley. Luckily, I've already got them in hand. They're ready to go. So now what we need to do is test our piston to valve clearance for real and see what we actually have in there. So all I did is I took some Play-Doh and I rolled it up into a little ball just to make sure I've got something that can squish down. And I placed it where the valves should be in relation to the piston. Then what we did is after we stuck them on there is I put a little bit of oil on top just to make sure that it's not gonna stick to the valve when it goes down. So then I installed both the intake and the exhaust rocker arms just to make sure that we had both sides ready to go. And I rotated the engine over a few times just to make sure that it was gonna make contact and make sure we got a good impression on the Play-Doh. So then all I had to do was remove the cylinder head and then I was able to see that, oh boy, our Play-Doh actually looks like it's supposed to. So now technically I should be using a depth gauge here, but I don't have one. So what I ended up using instead was a set of feeler gauges and I just added to the minimum clearance. So all I did to figure out how much clearance we had is I took a couple of feeler gauges, I stacked them together to what would be the minimum clearance. So technically our minimum clearance should probably be anywhere from 70 to 100 thousandths, but luckily we have way more than that. I was able to get at least 125 thousandths in there and it looked just fine. Now, we could have used a caliper to do this test the only problem is when you use a caliper, sometimes it can crush the Play-Doh, so you gotta be a little bit careful with that. Now, I did that test anyway just to verify, and when I used the caliper for the exhaust side, I had 180 thousandths, and then when I did the intake side, I actually got, I believe it was around 260 thousandths. Correct me if I'm wrong, but either way. But yeah, that's how you'd figure out what your clearances are. So we obviously have more than enough clearance now. We know that we're sitting right where we should. So now what we gotta do is get the cylinder head installed and get these push rods in. So let's do it. So I ran into a small issue and it has to deal with the head gasket. Let me show you. Okay, so I bought a Felpro gasket set for this engine rebuild. Problem is it came with these crappy head gaskets. These are what would be considered a composite gasket. They are not good. They are not what the OEM is. They're basically crap. So I went out and bought a set of legit OEM head gaskets. Let me show you the difference. So there's the crappy Felpro one, and here is the OEM style. This is a multi-layer steel. You can see there because there's literally multiple layers of steel. This is what would have come with the truck originally. So the OEM gaskets are about twice as much as the Felpro ones, but I'm telling you it's completely worth it because you don't want to have to be redoing this in six months. I got links to all the parts in the description, so don't worry, if you're looking for it, I got it down there. But anyway, let's go ahead and get these cylinder heads on. So here's the torque pattern for both the Gen 3 and Gen 4 stock bolts. The one thing you'll notice is that in Gen 3, there's a difference in bolts 9 and 10 because they were shorter in Gen 3, and by Gen 4, they were all the same size. So the original LS cylinder head bolts are torque to yield, so we have to get new bolts either way. So we ended up upgrading to a set of ARP bolts because they weren't that much more expensive, and they're reusable. So if you're doing this job, it's probably worth spending the extra 50 bucks just to get a nice set of bolts. So I just spent the last 24 hours freaking out because my computer gave me a black screen of death and I thought that I lost all the footage from this video, but turns out it's fine. It ended up just being the motherboard was destroyed. It was either that or the CPU, I don't know, computer stuff. Anyway, the point is the computer's fixed now. I still have the files and you probably know that because you're watching the video right now. But anyway, rocker arms. So I actually did a video about upgrading these trunnions on this rocker arm. So if you want to see that, Again, I'll put a link up there so you can see it. Um, but for installing these things, it's a very simple process. All we're gonna do is find dot to dot on the timing gear. This is one more reason why I don't do the oil pan or the timing covers until after we've done this because it just makes it easier when you can see what you're doing. But anyway, we've got top dead center, number one. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna tighten down the exhaust valves on one, two, seven, and eight. And then we're gonna tighten down the intake rocker arm bolts at one, three, four, and five. So it's 22 foot pounds for a Gen 3 engine. It's a 25 foot pounds for a Gen 4. So then what we're gonna do is we're gonna rotate the crankshaft 360 degrees, and then we're gonna tighten down the remaining rocker arms, which would be on the exhaust side, that would be three, four, five, and six. 
And then for the intake side, it would be two, six, seven, and eight. And then once those are all torqued down, we're gonna rotate the engine over a couple times just to make sure that nothing's hitting, which it shouldn't be because we already checked our piston to valve clearance, but just in case, we're just gonna check it and then we should be good to go. But yeah, that's how you do your rock arms. It's pretty simple. But now what we need to do is start working on some of our other seals, which one of them would be this part that I made a video when I was cleaning all these parts. And there's these little guys down here that get all gunked up. And in my case, well, some of them are really, really bad. So I ended up having to replace those, and luckily I've got plenty of seals because on this being a Gen 3, the knock sensors are in like the worst possible spot. Like the knock sensors go here and they go here. Like imagine if those go out on you when you need to replace them. But that's why I got two new ones. So you already know I got links down below. So check it out if you need some knock sensors. But otherwise, let's get this thing put in. <sighs> I'm so tired. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this little 30 mil here I'm gonna pop it in there and then just smash this thing out. Boom. And just like that, it's that easy. There she goes. So I'm gonna clean that up a little bit and then go put in the new seals. So the side that's inverted obviously goes to the inside, this goes to the outside. So we're just gonna take that, put it in place, and then we're gonna slowly tap that thing in. All right, so that's one down, now we'll do the other one. There you go, two new bung holes. So now all we gotta do is apply a little bit of lube to the little knock sensor nipples here. That way we can slide the bung holes over to nipples. So whenever you're dealing with rubber, you always wanna use a little bit of oil or something just to make sure that it doesn't have any problems. You can never have enough lube. So all I did was install the valley cover bolts at 18 foot pounds, then I moved on to installing the knock sensors. Those got tightened down at 15 foot pounds. Then I just hooked up all the little sensors and clips to them, put on the rubber boots. And then I installed the oil pressure sensor at 15 foot pounds. And then I moved on installing the cam sensor at 18 foot pounds. Ah, <sighs> it's a lot of tightening. All right, so now the valley cover's done. Let's go ahead and get to work on the oil pan. So I was getting the oil pan and everything together and then I discovered something. The uh, pickup tube is actually bent. I don't know if you could see that. That's not supposed to be that angle. That's very wrong. So I had to go pick up a new one. So that should give you an idea of just how bent it is. Yeah, it's a little bit out of whack. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and just get this oil pan and everything situated, but just know that I'm not actually torquing the oil pan on yet because we need to get the front and rear covers set before we do that. So let's get to it. So before I sealed up this engine, I wanted to make sure there was absolutely nothing in there that shouldn't be. Then I tightened down all the windage tray bolts to 18 foot pounds, but I made sure to put the pickup tube on there before doing that because otherwise I'd have to redo it. I tightened down the pickup tube bolt to the oil pump at 106 inch pounds, but prior to doing that, I made sure I lubed up that oil ring because if you pinch that oil ring, you could end up with zero oil pressure and blow your engine. Ask me how I know. So I'm a dum dum and forgot that I need to get the front cover on before we can go ahead and put this on because we got to level it with the engine block. But first I'm going to go ahead and hammer out this seal. Oh, good lord that was a pain. So I'm a bit of a dum-dum and I forgot to hit record, but I just tapped this thing up nice and dry with a rubber mallet. Good to go, so now we'll go put this thing on the engine. Okay, so luckily this part's pretty simple. It sounds complicated, but all we're going to do is we're going to put a little bit of RTV, I'm using the black style, on the edges where it connects to the oil pan and the front cover. Basically, we're just gonna line like this section of this gasket just with like a thin layer of that stuff. We could put a little bit extra, it won't matter. Um, but then the key is, is we need to get this thing level with the block. So we're gonna use a straight edge to do that. So let me go hook this thing up and I'll show you. Okay, so I've got just like this little bit here. I just gob some on there and I did the same thing over here. Just kind of plop that down there. So we should be good as far as our TV goes. And I already cleaned all this stuff up. So we're just gonna loosely hang this thing. Did I put that on? Oh, I flipped them. Ah, oh, damn it. Okay, so we'll put that on like that. Like a soul. Okay, now let's hang this thing on here. Oh my god. So when you look here, you'll see that this piece isn't exactly level and there's play in it to go one way or another. So we need to make sure that this thing is completely level from the block to the edge of this cover. So now you can just use a harmonic balancer to center this thing, but we're gonna use the tool. Uh, this thing just makes it a little bit easier, but you can just as easily slide the harmonic balancer on there. But this is gonna help us keep it perfectly centered so we can align it left to right. So let's do it. There we go. 
Okay, so that's on there. So you can see we got a little bit of left to right movement and we don't want that. So luckily the rear cover has a perfectly flat edge. So we're gonna use that to level it off. Basically what I'm doing is I'm holding it up from the bottom with my hand and getting it just tight enough to hold this thing in place. And then we're gonna do the same thing on this side. Whew, okay. There we go, that's good. That's good, okay. Cool. So I'm gonna do pretty much the same thing on the rear cover. Wow, that one came out way easier. So they saw a tool for aligning these things, but you gotta make sure you do it before you put in your rear main seal. I'm gonna put my rear main seal in because I don't have the tool, and we're just gonna line this thing up as best we can using a level, so let's get to it. All right, so there we go, we got it ready to go. Let's go slide this puppy on. So there's a small piece of this engine that mostly gets forgotten about, and it sits below the oil filter housing. It's called a barbell. And these barbells are pretty dirty and they're pretty messed up. My dad's was so rotten that it was falling apart when we were trying to pull it out. So we ended up buying an improved one. It's made out of aluminum and it's got two brand new O-rings on it. So we're gonna take that and insert it in the hole. Usually you just have to work it in a little bit, put a little bit of lube on the O-rings and it should slide right in. And there you have it. So installing the rear cover is a lot like the front cover. We still need to put RTV between the seals, between the points where the block and the oil pan meet. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna line this thing up with a flat edge just to make sure we get it even to the engine block. And we're gonna torque all the bolts down to 18 foot pounds. Now I'm also gonna put a dab of RTV on all the corners where the oil pan's gonna meet the two covers. That's just to prevent oil leaks in the future. So now when we go to put the oil pan on, we need to torque down all the M8 bolts to 18 foot pounds. And then there's two bolts that go into the rear cover that are long and skinny. Those are M6 bolts and they get torqued down to 106 inch pounds. Okay, so now it's time to do the harmonic balancer. Now this thing can be a pain in the neck, but luckily I got a tool that helps out. It's a harmonic balancer tool installer. But uh, I actually got it for a Chrysler because it's the only one that had a long enough rod that could fit into this hole. So uh, yeah, get you one of those if you're doing it on the LS. But let me show you how we put this thing on. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna put this thing on here just loosely, and then we're gonna use the tool to tighten this thing on. We're just gonna thread it in until it gets to the back. All right, there we go, so that's at the back. And then we're just gonna thread the nut all the way in. Okay, so I'm using a one and a quarter socket on there to get this thing over that nut. That's a big nut. And now we're just gonna tighten this sucker up and it should start pulling it on there. All right, so that's an issue. <laughs> so my socket's getting pushed off the nut now. Let's see, will this 32 fit on there? It will. Might be able to get a little extra length out of that one. Yep, that's working right there. I'm gonna take a pry bar in here just to make sure that it ain't able to move. Okay, so I got this thing about as tight as I'm gonna get it. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a tool out. We're gonna take the old harmonic balancer bolt and we're gonna tighten it down to the torque. So it's 240 foot pounds, but then we're gonna back this thing off and install a new bolt because these things are torque to yield. 200 oh good god <laughs> 240 foot pounds is a lot oh 220 <laughs> this is ridiculous ah! what do we get 240 okay now we can back this thing off so i gotta tell you <laughs> that is a lot harder than it looks when you're doing it by yourself holy crap but we got it yeah, there we go. Woo, that's better. Holy shit. Okay, so that recess is supposed to be there. So don't panic if it's not flush. It's not meant to be. So we got a brand new bolt from GM. We're gonna put this sucker in there. We're gonna torque it down to 37 foot pounds and then give it an extra 140 degrees worth of turning. <sighs> Hopefully it's not as bad as that 240 because my goodness, that was rough. Okay, there's 37. Okay. Now we're gonna do 140 degrees. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. This is gonna be fun. All right, here we go. 140, let's go, baby. Oh! Oh, shit. Hang on. Ah. Mother of Christ. Okay, so that's on there. Whew. 
All right. Oh yeah, you can see the uh, thread lockers coming out of there. So should be good. So now we're at the point where all we got to do is pour some oil on top of all of our rockers just to make sure they're nice and coated. Because this just kind of helps with the first start because hopefully here very soon we'll be able to do that. But I'll tell you what, when it comes to building engines, <laughs> it's always a lot more complicated than you think. I mean, look at this thing. This was supposed to be just a basic engine rebuild. And here we are. It took me almost two weeks to do this because it just kept running into issues. But you know what? At the end of the day, I think it's completely worth it because now we're going to have a completely fresh engine in a truck that's got 360,000 miles on a brand new transmission. So, you know, hopefully my dad will be happy with all the work that we did here. And hopefully that, you know, he'll be able to see that, hey, this wasn't just thrown together in a day and that we actually took our time with it and we made sure that it was done correctly. Because, you know, I want this thing to last another 300,000 miles if that's possible. And the only way that's going to happen is if we take our time with this stuff. Engine building is very tedious and it's something that's not easy to do. Don't let anybody fool you. And it always is more expensive than you think it's going to be when you start. Trust me, that's just how it goes. You know, if you were going to ask me about four months ago whether or not I ever thought this engine was going to be savable, my answer probably would have been no. Because this thing was just beyond gone. I mean, there was so much carbon and sludge built up inside this engine. I honestly don't know how this thing was able to spin around without tearing itself apart. I mean, it literally had 360,000 miles worth of just pure nasty sludge and carbon in here. I mean, it's just, it was bad. And then as we got deeper into the engine, we discovered the problem was much worse than we thought. We ended up spinning three main bearings and spun them in a pretty glorious manner. It ended up leaving a bunch of gouges into the side of the engine block and screwed up about three of the main caps. This one main bearing was literally seized onto the crankshaft because there was so much metal inside the oil galley that it couldn't move. But if you were to ask me what it would have been like restoring this thing back three months ago, well, this is what my answer would have been. So yeah, this is, this is looking more and more like a potential boat anchor. I mean, I knew this thing was gonna be a lot of work to restore. I was gonna have to clean up all these parts that were just completely covered in sludge. I was gonna have to paint the engine block, which that in itself is a whole project. And then not to mention actually putting this whole thing back together and trying to make it all work in one piece. I mean, I spent weeks just trying to get all the measurements right. And then when it came to actually assembling this engine, that in itself took another couple weeks because I kept running into issues finding parts or finding pieces that we needed or Maybe I ordered the wrong parts, but no matter what, we never gave up. And eventually, we got it done. I mean, look at this thing. I mean, you can actually read the oil fill cap. I mean, <laughs> that wasn't happening a few months ago. I mean, it's just incredible when I look back at this thing and realize that, like, hey, that was a lot of work. But man, was it ever worth it. Boy, oh boy. I have a feeling this is going to be a very long video, but it's intentional. The whole reason I wanted to make this video and do all of this stuff in one video is because I know that whenever I'm searching for stuff on the internet, a lot of times I'm going through and there's like 30 different creators. They all make these little clips and it's like, oh, I get to see like 30 videos just to get the whole story. Well, I wanted to put everything in one. So now you have everything you need if you're building an LS engine. And if you're not building an engine and maybe you just think engines are cool and you wanted to see how this stuff works. Hopefully this gives you a good idea of what it's like actually building an engine, the reality of it, the fact that it's not done in a day, it's not cheap and it's not easy, but it's completely doable. So if anything, I hope you enjoyed this video and stay tuned because in the next video, this thing's going in my dad's truck and hopefully he likes it. We'll see. So hopefully we'll get his reaction on this thing and we'll go take it for a drive. So anyway, I'm going to get out of here, get some rest, and I'll be sure to see you in the next one. Have a good day. Oh, it's got the crop on there. Fuck. All right, so we're gonna start grinding the second ring gears. Blech, ring gears? It's not a ring gear. Got everything, whoops. Looks like someone's calling again, here we go. So then, so, uh, so here, uh, blah, blah. so now that we know, blah, blah, I didn't have the stabilization, fuck. Oh well, whatever. My exposure is all jacked up. Good Lord, my hair's terrible. <laughs> the little bit I got left, mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, I was trying to set up this shot when my uh, tripod decided it had had enough. And uh, yeah, 
Yeah, I think it's time I get a new tripod. Oh man, that sucks.